cartoons. I loved the far side cartoons that used to be in the paper that Gary Lawson always drew. Uh, one of my favorites was God the Creator creating the world. And God is in a science lab in a white coat. And there's a big petri dish there. And the globe, the earth, is sitting in the dish. And over top is all this shelving with different, look like huge salt shakers. And they're all labeled. Plants, trees, fish, animals, sky, stars, humans. And the cartoon caption read, as God holds one, he says, and now for a little fun, jerks. <laughs> he always used to draw this little fat, nerdy kid. And, uh, you know, the kind of kid that he, he, was, he was going to the Midvale School for the Gifted and Talented. And the door said pull, and he's pushing the door trying to get in for the Gifted and Talented. Uh, but he, he had this cartoon where the little nerdy kid is on a psychiatrist's couch. And the psychiatrist got his black suit, got his glasses, of course, down on the end of his nose and his little goatee. And he's written on his notebook, just plain nuts because sometimes that's all you can say. And of course, a, a, a really funny one I loved was uh, these two, you know, we always wonder, what happened to the dinosaurs? How does such a large, powerful animal just disappear? And he has a, he has a, a land mass there, and two dinosaurs are standing there, and, and they see down on the horizon Noah's Ark sailing away with everything two by two. And the one dinosaur says, oh, darn, I thought it was tomorrow. <laughs> That's what happened to the dinosaurs. <laughs> I saw a cartoon once advertising a travel agency, and this couple is there with their, their baggage, and they come and they say, Anywhere! Just we want to escape from reality TV. Maybe you can identify with that. We are overrun with reality TV shows. And I understand the, the, the economic principle. You don't have to hire stars and pay big weekly salaries. You can find in our country all kind of people looking for that 15 minutes of fame. And they will do almost anything to get it. Try this, do that. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, you know, eat this. Uh, it's still moving. You know, eat this, you know. You'll win a trip to New York. Okay, I mean, you know, I'm so glad Catholics kept fasting in because on those days, I was, excuse me, this is a fast day. We don't eat walking animals on fast days. You know, I'll, I'll pass. Uh, seems to me that, that when we look at all the risks that people take, the, the scripture is also talking about risk this morning. It seems to me the word of God is challenging us. What risks are we willing to take? What personal investment are we willing to commit for the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the only reality that we need to focus on. It is the only reality that will still exist when everything here, including us, is gone and eternity has dawned. We need a healthy dose of what we might call reality spirituality, not reality television. Jesus, the great teacher, was keeping it real as he always did. As he commented to the crowd one day, he pointed to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Magnificent building laid with gold, shining marble, the finest of appointments inside, wonderful timber. And he said, you see this splendor? One day all of this is going to come a-tumbling down and not one stone will be left on top of another stone. Absolute and total devastation. And to the Jewish mind, in that time, the temple made present for them the presence of God. They saw that temple, they knew that God was with them. If it would be destroyed, where would God be? So they, they heard what Jesus said. They said, look at this. Impossible that this would come a tumbling down. This temple, they said to Jesus, was built by the materials that our ancestors brought back 
from the second slavery in Babylon several hundred years ago. They were equipped with gold and marble and, and timber to, to build a magnificent structure. And now you're telling us it's all going to come tumbling down? That, that God's felt presence among us is going to disappear? Ain't going to happen. We also said that man would never fly, didn't we? But you get in that metal cylinder and you pack three or four hundred people in there, stick on a couple of wings and four jet engines, and you wake up in the morning in London or Rome. Uh, impossible. Man fly? No. Go to the moon? Impossible. Not going to happen. Cure diseases? Diseases have been here since mankind arrived. Remember when you were, you were my age, remember when you were kids, get that polio vaccine and all the booster shots? And now polio is virtually non-existent as a disease. Organ transplants, you can live with somebody else's heart? Impossible. Artificial limbs, artificial knees? Impossible. Can't happen. But we see it happen every day, don't we? While we still await the cure for HIV and cancer, and indeed, we're making some progress. We look back and see in how many instances the word impossible has been scratched off the list. Waves through the atmosphere. Waves that have sound and picture connected to them. And we find a way to connect with those waves and, and we can see events live as they're occurring halfway around the world. Impossible, we say. How could that happen? And yet 50 years ago this month, how our nation was glued to TVs, bringing us pictures from Dallas, pictures from Washington, of the assassination and the funeral of President Kennedy. We have to wonder sometimes, I don't know about you, but I do, is there any space left up there for more waves? We got radio, TV, shortwave, cell phones, you know the interesting thing? Cell phones always find your phone. You know, when we had landlines, you picked it up, and a lot of times you got the wrong number. I'm sorry, you hung up and tried again. Cell phones always find you. Even if you lose your phone, you just call yourself, it'll ring somewhere and somebody will bring it to you. It's, it's, you just think there should be no more room up there, but there is. It's just, it's just interesting. I, I, I had to call Betty Butler one day. We had a funeral coming up. I needed somebody to play. So I called her, and, and the funeral was Saturday. I said, Betty, called her on Wednesday. I said, Betty, I, I, I got an emergency. I got a funeral on Saturday. She said, well, I'm walking off a plane. I said, where are you? She said, Hawaii. She didn't come back for the funeral. <laughs> just pick it up in 10 seconds. You're talking to somebody in Hawaii. How, how does this happen? Destroy this temple right here in Jerusalem with its gleaming marble, its, its gilded gold, the house of the Lord destroyed, not one stone left upon another. Impossible. Jesus, you'll know what you're talking about. Except in 70 A.D., even while some of the audience that was with him that day was still alive, the Roman armies entered Jerusalem leveled that temple, not one stone left upon another. In that day, his remarks puzzled many people, no doubt disturbed and frightened some, and agitated and antagonized many others. Well, teacher, when's this going to happen? And what's the sign that it's going to happen so we'll, we'll know this is about to occur? And with that question, Jesus began to teach his lesson in reality spirituality. Now church, please remember, Jesus is describing in very general terms what was going on then, what is going on today, what has always gone on in recorded history and will no doubt continue as far as we can see down the road. This world of ours, these times are filled with chaos and confusion. 9-11 just turned the page, brought a new dimension was now right under our noses. How dare they attack our country? The pillars of a, the economy, how dare they, right in front of us, destroy 
our property. We, we felt the shockwave. This, this was thought to be impossible. How could it happen? Remember when you were again were my age, remember in school, every school has fire drills. We had air raids, air raid practice, because the Russians were coming, remember? The Russians were coming with the atomic bomb, and we had to be ready. Uh, because we're close to Washington, and Washington was a target. We had Bethlehem Steel. Bethlehem Steel was a target. You got to be ready for air raids. And they told us when you hear seven blasts on the horn to get up and get under your desk. And I'm figuring, okay, seven blasts on the horn. A I R R A I. Okay, I follow that. <laughs> get down and, and hide your face because uh, when the atomic bomb explodes, it gives off a little bit of extra light, so you don't want your eyes to be affected. A little bit extra light. And then cover your face because, you know, from the, from the waves, the shock waves, one or two of the windows in, in your classroom might break. So cover your face up good. And then, then when you hear seven more signs, seven more that you know the air raid's over, and get back up and get back to your geography. You know, talk about on reality. We were living it. The reports of our fighting today in Afghanistan. We've been fighting this war on terrorism longer than any war we've ever been involved in. And we're finding out trying to fight terrorism is like trying to grab wet soap. You just can't get a hold of it. We don't even pay attention anymore, most of us, about reports or casualties. Our sisters and brothers are dying on the African continent in record numbers from violence, disease, and starvation creating two nations, take, taking Sudan and separating it into North and South Sudan, has not cut back on the violence and the bloodshed. Nation against nation. What have we heard from Haiti? After that incredible earthquake and the subsequent hurricane, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere is still a mess. And the world's attitude seems to be, hey, we gave at the office. Our sisters and brothers continue to suffer there. Where in the world is the world community in the face and length of such chaos and calamity? The pictures we've been receiving from the Philippines tear at our hearts. We're going to lift an offering for them today. And this all reminds us what Jesus said, the poor you have always with you. Which means you can't just say, I gave once at the office. But we have to be responsive to the needs of our brothers and sisters. But none of those incidents and situations could begin to match the emotion and the, the fear that people felt when they heard Jesus talking about their temple coming down stone by stone. If we Catholics woke up tomorrow morning and heard on the news report that somehow St. Peter's Basilica was leveled to the ground in the Vatican State, we would be obviously be upset and concerned about how could this happen and did people die and all the questions we would ask. But it wouldn't affect us nearly as much as it would affect our brothers and sisters had that temple come a-tumbling down like it did. So in their agitated state, teacher, well, what sign are we going to see that this is going to happen? As if the sign could help them to alleviate it. What are we going to see? Well, God gives us a sign. He gives us a sign that says, my people, you don't have to worry or fret. He gives us a sign that points us to the way out of all dangers, toils, and snares. A sign that will lead us through it all. The sign is the blessed assurance whose name is Jesus. A blessed assurance that guarantees I will be with you all days. A blessed assurance that tells us don't let your hearts be troubled. A blessed assurance that taught us our fears are useless. What we need is faith. Not maybe, not if we're good, but an assurance, a promise, a commitment, an unfailing, I will be with you. As we would say today, you can go to the bank on that. The sign that God has given us is described in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave, 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 gave his only begotten son. Do you understand because of that sign just how serious God is about you and just how seriously God takes you and how much God loves you. Jesus is the only sign that you will ever need, the only sign you can always count on, 
the only sign that remains constant in the midst of chaos, the only sign that brings us peace in a world drowning in violence, the only sign that brings us hope when we are tempted to give up, give out, and give in. The only sign that tells us the truth in the face of Satan's lies. The only sign that brings clarity out of life's confusion. The only sign that brings us strength for today and a reason to get out of bed tomorrow morning. So through it all, church, hold on to Jesus. He and he alone is the life jacket in the midst of the storms of life. And Jesus, the great sign points us to another sign, an extension of the sign that he is. The sign is his cross. He came down to earth to be lifted up, to draw all unto him. When we call upon our wonderful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we trace that cross upon ourselves. The cross is a sweet and certain anointing. It is a general but sh gentle but sure reminder of how much we are loved by God. Is it, a re it is a reminder that nothing, 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 absolutely nothing can take away the commitment, the love that our God has for us. Not even our worst sin in our worst moment can take away the love that our God has for us. When we make that sign of the cross, we can say in the name of the Father who loves me, in the name of Jesus, the Son of God who loves me, in the name of the powerful Holy Ghost who loves me, I am saved, I am loved, I am God's child. Our church knew what it was doing when it said, when you begin to pray, pray and with that sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, because when we pray, whoever we thought we were, wherever we may have strayed, whatever we might have done, wherever, whether we've been sinful and broken, lost, confused, unsure, doubting, unsettled, uncommitted, faith shaken, hope shattered, love selected, there is still a Father who loves us. There is still the only Son of that Father who loves us. There is still the Spirit flowing from that Father and Son who loves us who is committed to us, who has already forgiven us, who is calling out to us, throwing out the lifeline. That's love, church. That's love. When we are drowning deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, too far out for a rescue boat, too far out for swimmers, he throws out the lifeline to us. And love lifted us. Can you hear the echo from the mountaintop? of transfiguration to the voice of God that is never silenced. This Jesus is my son. Listen to him. Hold on to him, church. Listen to Jesus. You know, scientists suggest that sound never disappears. Sound is never silenced. It goes on. Somewhere out in mega space, is every word that has ever been spoken, every sound that has ever been made, every statement ever spoken is out there. If we only had a way to bring it back, we could actually hear that voice that Peter, James, and John heard. If we found a way to bring it back, we could hear the echo of Easter evening when Satan thought he had silenced that voice, that Jesus guy forever. When he stood in that upper room and said, Peace be with you. Receive my spirit. Receive my power. Receive my life. Peace. Be still. I know that I am God. We can hear that voice of Jesus. Hold on to him, church. Hold on. Reality, spirituality says, this world will end, and my presence in this life will end. And I know not the day nor the hour, so I hold on to Jesus. Reality, spirituality is the reminder that we are truly living in the last days. We are living in the end times. They started 2,000 years ago with the coming of the Savior. And that these last days and end times will conclude when he comes back again and not one second before that. So hold on to Jesus. See, the, the end of the world singers keep singing that Jesus is coming soon to clean up our mess. But Jesus is singing another song that says, clean up your own mess. You made it. You clean it up. And we have the ability to do that. He told us how. 
You want to clean up your mess? Love one another as I have loved you. Forgive even your enemies. Blessed are the peacemakers. Work to make justice flow like a mighty river. Share your bread with your hungry brother or sister. Become God's good and faithful servant. Resist the devil and he will have to flee. He told us how to clean up our mess. Reality, spirituality is that Jesus is the one and only Savior of the world. That's why these are the last days. The Father looked around. He ain't got nothing else to send. He gave everything he had because he loved us just that much. And Jesus is coming back. But I believe, I understand it. I believe he's coming back when we cleaned up our mess, when we have proven him correct and ourselves wrong. When we get this world straightened out, because we messed it up, not him. When we get it straightened out, he will come back and say amen. So don't sit around and wait for his coming. Get up and work and make that kingdom of God a reality. Think about it. There's nobody else to send. Mary, you're going to have a son. Call him Jesus. He will save God's people. Jesus is a forever savior. Calvary was just once, but the love that flowed from Calvary's side is forever. And I've got some news for you this morning. The blood that gives us strength that flows from day to day will never, never, never lose its power. The power of Jesus saving death has saved a wretch like me and has saved the wretch that is me and has saved each one of us, our grandparents and God, and grandparents and parents, our children and our children's children. The Savior has come. The Savior is here with us this morning, and he will come again at the end of time when we cleaned up the mess we made in the first place. So hold on to Jesus, church. Jesus spoke to the crowd that day about the chaos and confusion, the death and destruction that were to come, and he told them, don't worry. Don't be frightened over it. You know, when you look at life, what can you control? Only yourself. Someone can lie on you. You can't control that. Someone can call you everything but a child of God. You can't control what they say. Somebody may try to harm you. You can't control that. Reality, spirituality says control what you can control yourself. See, if you have love in your heart, they can talk about you, but you won't become a gossip. If you have love in your heart, they will lie on you, but you won't lie on them. They will cheat you, but you will not cheat them. They will harm you, you will do no injury to them. They will try to kill you, but you will never die as a murderer. Hold on to Jesus. Only you can choose Jesus for yourself. Only you can believe for yourself. Only you can commit to Christ for yourself. Only you can enter the kingdom for yourself. You may have had a praying grandma who lived half her life on her knees. Your mother may have loved you even to excess. Your father may have worked two or three jobs to keep some food on the table. Your sisters and brothers may have walked you to church when you were a little child. But only you can choose now to embrace Jesus and to claim him and to hold on to him as your own. World events can take a person's life in the blink of an eye, happily heading on a vacation, but going through LAX and some clown decides to start shooting in there. Shopping in a mall in Nairobi to buy a birthday present for a friend and terrorists come and shoot up the mall and burn it down. Little child, six years old, sitting there in school learning your ABCs, thinking you something at six years old because I can read and drawing a picture for mommy to put on the refrigerator till some guy comes in and kills 40-some people. But nothing in the world, nothing in the world has the power to take your name out of the book of life if you hold on to Jesus. You and I have been living in the last days since the day we each were born. I want to suggest to you this morning, put your calendar away and get out your Bible. Every day God wakes up and starts you out and clothes you in your right mind is an opportunity for you. I remember several years ago, I was down at Our Lady of Consolation in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the church where Deacon Knight uh, went to, to uh, be deacon at when he and his wife moved down there back to, to North Carolina. And I got a, they had a testimony one night at their revival and a brother got up and he looked around the church and he said, Church, I have to confess, I need you to pray for me because I failed my test today. And people, you know, he going to school, night school, what was he talking about? You know, he works. He said, I failed my test today. 
He said, every day I go to work. He said, my wife, she's wonderful. She fixes me this beautiful lunch, and I put it in a brown sack, and I take my lunch to work. And I got to work today, and, and the assembly line had produced at such a tremendous rate, the boss said, I'm taking you all to lunch. So they shut down the assembly line, and for three hours, we went to this high-class restaurant, ate ourselves silly, the boss paid for it, we came back, and now I'm coming home. He said, I was on the parking lot fishing around for my keys, he said, and I heard a voice. And the voice said, can I have that sandwich? He said, and all I had was the same brown bag I carried in, because I didn't eat my lunch, I got taken to lunch. He said, the sandwich, but you, you didn't know it was my lunch, I was going home. And I was fumbling for the keys, and I was happy, I couldn't wait to go tell my wife. And I said, oh, brother, I ain't got nothing. He said, and I pulled my keys out, and I said, you know, you're really bad, you're wrong. He said, you got treated this fine lunch. He said, this poor brother here is hungry. He turned around to give him the bag, and he was gone. He looked around, looked under cars, big parking lot. He's gone, he said. And I realized in that moment, it was Jesus. I was hungry. Did you give me to eat? He said, I failed my test today. I need the church to pray for me. Each day, church, is a blessing. Each day is a gift. Each day is an opportunity for thanksgiving and for service. Each day is a day I've never seen before, and each night is a closure. As I realize that day is one I'm never going to have back again. What did I do while I had it? And tomorrow will be another opportunity for thanking God, another opportunity to pledge myself to God's service should the Lord choose to wake me to see another day. Each morning is a mini resurrection as each morning my God chooses to wake me up, calls me to rise, shine, and give God the glory. He sends me a sunlight to light the path and to warm me up, reminding me of the warmth of His love, reminding me that He is the light of the world. He sends me a realization that this new day can be very different from yesterday. I am not locked into my yesterdays, thanks be to God, with all my mistakes and missed opportunities, because I know somebody whose name is grace and mercy, somebody who has already forgiven the sins of my past and tossed them into that sea of forgetfulness, somebody who kissed me with the dawn's early light and said, brother, my grace is sufficient for you, go get them. In our homes, someone will inevitably say before the family retires for bed, did you put out the trash? At four o'clock each weekday morning, a trash truck used to ride up our driveway back here to the two dumpsters that are next to the Head Start building. And they emptied the trash from the past day's Head Start lunches and activities, they emptied the trash from the church, <clears throat> and emptied whatever trash our good neighbors managed to sneak in under cover of darkness. <laughs> and without fail, they would lift up the dumpsters and dump them in the truck and then unceremoniously drop the dumpsters on the ground with no effort to realize that I am asleep, or I was asleep. <laughs> the dumpsters became my new alarm clock. We now have a new trash company, and they do the same dumb thing. <laughs> but I'm so glad this morning that I know somebody who doesn't wait until 4 o'clock to dump the trash out of my life. No sooner do I sin than His grace and mercy rush in, toss that junk out of my life, and embrace me with godly love. No sooner do I turn off my computer and get down and send God an email telling Him about my day, asking for forgiveness, that He reminds me, you're loved. And as I said to that thief on the cross, I'll say to you, should you die before you wake, this day, this day, this day, this very night, you will be with me in paradise. Reality, spirituality says, listen to Jesus. Don't be deceived. Don't be terrified. Don't follow the religious chicken littles of the world who love to announce that the sky is falling, the world is ending any day. I'm so glad that through it all, I can see the Son of God rising. Remember Y2K? It's all going to break down. We're going to be frozen. Everything's going to fall apart. What did we discover? Y2K means yes to the king. We've got to keep busy, church. We've got to keep so busy serving our master, we don't have time to die. Reality TV shows come and go. 
Reality, spirituality endures forever. If you hold on to Jesus, you don't have to worry about who's dancing with the stars. You'll be dancing in the stars with a crown of victory on your head. If you hold on to Jesus, you don't have to worry about whether you're smarter than a fifth grader. You will have joined that vast army who were wise and decided to make Jesus your choice. You don't have to travel to the Jersey Shore. You will arrive at that distant shore when God swings down that old ship of Zion to sail you to the other side. When all the saints in glory, Mama and Daddy and your brothers and sisters and spouses and maybe children will be there on the party to welcome you in to this glorious new home. You don't have to worry about Judge Judy, Judge Joe Brown, Judge Pigmeat, Judge whoever. Your judge is the Lord Jesus the Lord Jesus, who is the Supreme Court Chief Justice. His name is Judge Gracious and Merciful, Judge Patient and Understanding, and he bangs his gavel with authority. He listens to the testimony, and he bangs that gavel and pronounces sentence, a sentence that no one can revoke. He sentences us to light, Life in the Father's house. Life in the kingdom of God. And Satan, the prosecutor, is going to stand there and say, but wait a minute, I've got a list of charges. I've got a list of all the mess he did. And Jesus will say, I dropped the charges. Satan, take a hike. Come on in. Hold on to Jesus. You will not see a, a judge in a black robe. You will see two angels with a long white robe coming to drape it upon you so you can march into glory. You don't have to apply for home improvement. See, this old home, this robe of flesh, it's made to wear out. Got a pacemaker, pops several legal pills a day, have to wear support stockings to keep the blood flowing in my veins. But oh, when I get home, Deacon... Won't be no pacemaker. Won't be no pills to pop. I can walk around with a pacemaker. No support stockings. I won't need support hose. I've been leaning on Jesus for my support. A doctor named Jesus will take it all away. And he will give me a new and incorruptible perfect and glorious body and he will take me to the banquet table he will tell me sit down and eat and when he tells me to sit and eat at that heavenly banquet table he will not be like my cardiologist who reminds me you'll need to lose 20 pounds he will say feast forever feast forever at my table We won't have to worry about somebody whose name is Donald, who's got a bad hair job, it looks like he's been sucking on an onion all his life. We don't have to wait for him to tell us we're fired and he sends a car to drive us away. Somebody's swinging down a chariot to pick me up and to take me on to the other side. We will hear a voice, a strong yet sweet voice speak, well done. My good and faithful servant, welcome home, my precious child. I gave my life so you could be here and enjoy all of this forever. Enjoy. Come in. Take your rest. Share your master's joy. That's reality, spirituality, church. It's yours. It's mine. If we just hold on to Jesus. Amen.